Welcome to the New York Business Leaders Podcast, presented by The Coil Group. We interview the most interesting and influential business leaders in New York and hear their stories of success, challenges, and lessons learned while building their businesses and personal brands. New episodes drop weekly, so please be sure to subscribe to get updates in your favorite stream. Without further delay, here's your host of the New York Business Leaders Podcast, Gordon Coyle. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Gordon Coyle. Today I speak with Warwick Fairfax, who's got a really interesting story that is the foundation of a recently published book entitled Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trials to Lead a Life of Significance. I don't want to spill the beans here, but early in his career, Warwick went through a spectacular crucible moment and came out the other side with a perspective that's reflected in this book. We speak a lot about bouncing back after hardship, crucible moments, and creating that life of significance and meaning. This is good stuff that you won't want to miss. For more about Warwick and his book and his consulting practice, you can visit crucibleleadership.com. You can follow him on Facebook and LinkedIn, and you can actually order the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and anywhere books are sold. He also narrated the audible version of the book as well. Finally, if you have an interesting story that you'd like to tell on this podcast, drop me an email. My email address is gbcoil at thecoilgroup.com. Thanks. Now on to the show. Hey, everyone. I'm Gordon Coyle. Welcome back to the New York Business Leaders Podcast. Today, I've got a special guest, Warwick Fairfax, is with me, who's written a book, has a consulting practice, and has a very interesting story that I'd like him to share with us. And we're going to get deeper into that. So, Warwick, welcome to the show. Could you spend a couple of minutes introducing yourself and the, what the book is about and what you're doing today? Yeah, well, again, thanks so much, Gordon, for having me and super excited to be here. So, basically, my book, Crucible Leadership Embrace Your Trials to Lead a Life of Significance. What it talks about, in essence, is my crucible and, and my trial. So, um, you know, I'm sure you have a business audience, may even be some family business audience folks uh, in the audience. So, I grew up in Australia, in Sydney, in a five generation family business. Uh, I was founded in 1841, um, and it grew to be a very large media company that had the Australian equivalent of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal the major opinion leaders of our country. It had TV, radio stations, newsprint mills. It was a massive company. Um, and like sometimes happens in family businesses, and I think I saw on LinkedIn, you, uh, you know, have some, you know, family business understanding yourself yeah, in terms of sure what do. you do. I think I saw that there. So you kind of get the idea. Um, but there were some frictions over the generations. So by the time I came along, um, I was one, you know, I think of biblically, you know, the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. I was kind of the son that stayed home and worked hard and took life very seriously. I wasn't like the profligate go off and, you know, uh, spend money, be merry, all that kind of thing. That wasn't me. So I um, did my undergrad at Oxford, like my dad and some other relatives, worked on Wall Street, got my MBA at Harvard Business School, all to prepare myself for leading role. And as I'll get into later, it wasn't so much about what I wanted to do is this is what is required. I'm going to make sure I'm qualified to do the job. Duty on a country, I've never been in the military, but that kind of sense. So uh, come back from Harvard Business School in 87. My dad died earlier that year. He was in his 80s. I was from his third marriage. And it was a company with 50% held by uh, the family, the rest by you know, the stock market. There was rumors of takeovers. Uh, it's the 80s, the year of you know, the corporate raiders. Uh, I felt the company wasn't being run along the deals of the founder and there was management had made some, in my view, some uh, decisions that weren't so good. So at 26 was my youthful naivety crusader mentality, which can be a toxic mix, I gotta say. Uh, I launched this <laughs> so two point, I launched this $2.25 billion takeover of the company. Now, you know, why you know, you're in risk management. I mean, why a bank would lend me that kind of money? Talk about risk management. They probably could have used your service. It's just like, <laughs> what are you thinking? This is extreme risk, you know, but they did. I mean, I had some share, shares as collateral, so I get it. But anyway, 
So uh, families sold out. They didn't want to be in a company controlled by a 26-year-old. I mean, who would? I get it. Uh, October 87 stock market crash at our asset sales. So by the end of 87, we had an unsustainable level of debt. I brought a new management. We didn't increase operating profits by 80%, but the debt was so high, it really didn't matter. So by the end of 1990, uh, the company went into, uh, Australia went into a big recession, newspapers are cyclical, and the company went under. So that's kind of the short story of what happened. And so what my book is about is the core of it's my story. I also talk about uh, other members of my family, some inspirational faith, historical leaders. But the point is, how do you bounce back from your worst day, whether it's financial failure, physical, emotional how do you bounce back from your worst day and lead what we call a life of significance, a life on purpose dedicated to serving others? So it's kind of briefly my story and what the book's about. Okay. Um, great intro. Um, great, you know, kind of setting the stage. So what happens between the time um, of the bankruptcy and to today? What, what transpired over that time for you? Well, whenever you lose something like a family business or something like this, and in my case, it wasn't just producing widgets, uh, nothing wrong with that, but you know, we thought that we were performing a service to the nation of Australia, producing quality papers. You know, We didn't interfere with editorial. We weren't this kind of 19th century media baron, if you will. Um, you know, it wasn't like a William Randolph Hearst or that kind of thing, or you know, whoever one wants to look at today. So probably, you know, what was crushing about that is it felt like I let my family down. I mean, it was a big company, like back then, 700 million plus in revenues, 4,000 employees. So it felt like I'd, you know, destabilized the life of employees. People talk about safe space. Well, people in that company, the employees felt they had a safe space, a family that cared for them and, you know, weren't going to interfere or, or do things politically. It was, you know, going to be run fairly. So the sense I'd let, you know, maybe thousands of employees down, uh, other family members, yes, they sold out and got considerable wealth, but they didn't want to sell out. Uh, I felt like the founder of, of the company was a person of very strong faith, uh, as I am and was, I felt like God had some kind of plan and I let that down, which maybe is poor theology, but so it was a whole confluence of, you know, how could I have been so dumb? You know, I had a Harvard MBA and there are always reasons but why did I, why did I do that? And so part of the journey back in the nineties, I had a, my wife's American. We met in Australia in the late eighties. I came to America uh, in late 1990s. So part of the journey was forgiving myself. You know, I wasn't unintelligent, but I made some cataclysmically poor decisions. So the journey back was partly finding myself. It was hard as a ex media mogul to find work. And you put that on your resume, it's a job killer, let me tell you. It's like, yeah, no, I'm humble, I work hard, I don't think so. <laughs> Next, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, I got work at an aviation services company doing business and financial analysis. This was pretty much in the late 90s, pre-internet. So um, wasn't as easy to Google me. And, you know, I kind of dumbed down my resume, which ethically seemed like it didn't bother me at the time. <laughs> you know, so I worked hard, got good performance reviews, Eventually felt like, you know, I need to be doing more with my life than this. Not that anything wrong with it. Got into executive coaching. I'm an international coach, Federation certified coach. I found my voice asking questions. I even found a leadership voice by asking penetrating questions. From there, I got on two non-profit boards. I'm an elder at my non-denominational church in Maryland, where we live. I got on the board of a non-profit school, uh, you know, a Christian school. And I began to find just, I can ask good questions. I can be a good board member because, you know, I, I'm very um, blessed to work uh, in an organization with two very good uh, heads of those two nonprofits, but they may be good friends, but it doesn't stop me, you know, caring for, if you will, the constituents, which ultimately would be a higher power and, you know, the congregation and asking tough questions. <clears throat> so, Probably the key uh, pivot for me, which where it got me into what I'm doing now, is in 2008, the pastor of my church said, well, Warwick, um, I'd love for you to give a sermon illustration of the sermon I'm giving, and you know, just talk for about 10 minutes about your story. And certainly back then, I didn't give a lot of speeches, and uh, I thought, okay. 
So I talked about my story, and since it's a church, what I felt like God had taught me. And what amazed me is weeks and months after, people came up to me and said, you know, Warwick, your story helped me so much. And I'm thinking, how many former media moguls are there in the congregation? Like none. How could, this wasn't a story of cancer, of divorce, of, you know, normal business failure. This was just something nobody goes through. But somehow by sharing openly and, uh, and honestly, it, it seemed to resonate. From there, I thought, okay, I never wanted to write a book saying, you know, I was right, everybody else was wrong. Because <clears throat> those books are boring and untrue. But if I can write a book to help people talk about my story and the lessons learned, here's what I did wrong, don't do what I did. So it, it took me years to write, because imagine writing about the most painful things you've ever gone through. After a couple hours a day, I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> So that, that really launched the whole thing, the book. And then from there, you know, we have a podcast beyond the crucible, social media <clears throat> blogs, but um, yeah, the book all started with that talk in 2008 in church. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and from the book, uh, some of the notes I've got here, you talk about, and, and this is kind of important to me is personal vision fitting with gifts and talents. Um, I think a lot of people go through life without even coming to that realization, that understanding of connecting those two things that helps propel you through, it doesn't even have to be a crucible moment. It could be just daily life and work. Um, how do you help people with making those connections? I think firstly, uh, you've got to understand who you are. You know, what do you believe? And for me, it's my faith in Christ. It could be in a major religion. It could be in some other philosophy, but you know, who am I and what I, I believe? And, and that has value. Too often we think all too logically like, hey, you know, my mom or dad's an accountant or a doctor. That's a good business, which it is. Let me go into it. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But ask yourself, it may be a good business, but maybe I like art. Maybe I like painting. Maybe I like teaching. Now, will it be as hard? Will it be as easy to make a lot of money being a painter as, you know, being an accountant? You know, it might not be that easy, but you know, there are ways of doing it. Maybe you could be a curator in an art museum. I mean, there's creative ways of still being in art and making a decent living depending on your choices. But so part of it is just understanding who you are and don't just do something because your parents or friends say, oh, you can make a good living in X, but do you enjoy it? Is it tied to what makes your soul sing? So understand your fundamental wiring. You can, there's all sorts of assessments that you know we all know whether it's Myers Briggs or Strength Spine, it's a lot. Ask friends and family. So, you know, who am I? What what do you think I'm good at? Everybody that knows you, that knows us, they know who you are. It's not a big secret. You know, um, there will be violent agreement from most of them about who we are, our strengths and weaknesses, you know. So anchor what you do and who you are. And then in terms of vision, you know, obviously it's got to be something you're good at and, and connected to your wiring beliefs. But for a lot of folks that we talk to on our podcast, Beyond the Crucible, out of their crucible moment, which could be financial failure, emotional, physical, sometimes you think what I went through, I don't want another living person going through. How can I help people who've gone through it? Um, not always, but very often your vision come, can come out of pain, or maybe it's something that you just can't help, you can't sleep at night because you're so excited about this thing that's on your heart. So you've got to be passionate about your vision business or any endeavor is tough. So if you're not passionate about it, you'll have, you might have the perseverance to stick out the hard time. So really finding vision in, in a nutshell is anchored in your fundamental design, as well as your beliefs. And typically, or often it's uh, the roots of your vision is maybe a crucible or something that was painful that you feel you're on a mission to help others. There's all, the best visions that have sustained power there's an other-centered focus, what we call a life of significance, a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. If you have a vision that's outward focused rather than I just want to be wealthy and it's all about me and I'm a narcissist and that's great, but the chances of long-term sustainable business success is, is much lower than if there's an altruistic outward focus. So I would yeah. agree. And so interesting um, with this personal vision and gifts and talents, a lot of people in their youth, especially going into college, getting out of college, going into graduate school, whatever it may be at that, you know, I still consider a tender age in their 20s and early 30s. Mm -hmm. They haven't really fully developed that 
vision. They don't know what really gets them going. So let's say somebody has that realization when they're 40. How do they make a shift or how do you advise young people if they're not there yet mentally? And if they don't get there until they're in their 40s or maybe their 50s or later, how do they make a life shift around that? Yeah, I think if you're in your 20s, first of all, um, all about, you know, my kids are, you know, most of them are in their, in their 20s. So I get that uh, time of life. But, you know, honor your parents and all that and aunts and uncles, but, you know, your life matters. And so you've got to do what, what you feel motivated to do, not just because mom or dad says you need to do A, or a and B. So that's one of the first hurdles as a young person, or maybe it's a mentor, you know. So figure out, okay, I've got to do it because I want to do it, not because everybody else is telling me I can make a good living or I have connections in X field. So you've got to put a stake in the ground saying, I am going to be who I am. I'm going to honor how I was made and designed. So that's the first big shift. Forget what, not forget. Don't completely buy into everything that other people tell you to do, especially if it's not anchored in who you are. So that's the biggest single thing. And then, you know, <clears throat> the idea that you can map out a 30, 40, 50 vision for your life with Gantt charts and strategic planning, milestones, just life is not like that. But, you know, if you believe in some greater, higher power, you know, life will unfold as, as it's meant to be in a sense, if you're attuned. So part of that is, you know, what's one next step I can take? What's something I can do, you know, um, you know, you could pick any field that you want to. You're not going to be, you know, a partner in some venture capital firm day one. But if you like entrepreneurial stuff, well, what's a company that I can start with? You know, like a good first step that I can learn the ropes of X industry. If that's one I truly feel caught. Cool. You might find you hate it. Well, fine, then you can go try something else. But don't be afraid to try things. If it's more altruistic on the side, you know, maybe there's some things you can volunteer with on the weekends at a church or nonprofit. And pretty soon, you know, talk to other people, you'll find something that makes your soul sing. So if it's in line with your design and it's in line with your fundamental beliefs, then you might, then it's worth trying. But, you know, you won't figure out your whole vision when you're in your 20s or 30s. And if you're 40, don't feel, or 50 or 60, don't feel like, let's say a 40, 45 year old, it's easy to think it's too late. I'm in my track. I'm on track to be a partner at some accounting firm or whatever. If I give up, then I lose all these benefits. And once I'm partner or once I'm tenured at the university, whatever it is, that's all good. But you only have one life, you know, and how important is being a partner or a tenured professor? It may be important to you, but if it's not, it's like, well, what is it that I want to do? Don't be afraid of pivoting. Maybe it will be less income, but if it makes your soul soar and sing, and just gives you incredible happiness, that's worth a lot of money. It's all, it's, it's your decision, but you know, don't be afraid of asking those questions. And is this really what I love? Is it, it, is it based on what I design and believe in? So it's just, you gotta be willing to ask yourself these questions and hopefully you can have close friends or family that are willing to walk with you a bit and you know, be fellow travelers and ask them to help you in that. So. It really begins with the inner. Yeah. Dive down into your inner soul, what you really believe, what you what really excites you. You ask the right questions, you'll find your path. But it begins mm -hmm. with the the inner, the inner dive, if you will. Yeah. I, I think that a lot of people, regardless of their age, um, they probably have those moments in their life. I'm thinking about somebody maybe in their 45 age range. You know, I, I really don't like what I do. I'm not happy with what I'm doing. It's just not fulfilling me but fear holds them back from ever even asking that question. Um, and I think that kind of gets into the next question about higher purpose, faith, religion. Um, are, are you, you've kind of mentioned that a couple of times. Are, are you, oh. do you have a theory on faith, religion, organized religion, non-organized religion, higher purpose, kind of give us some sure. thoughts there of where people turn when they're facing this fear. Yeah, I mean, I use faith in a broad sense, but there's also the fear of like leaving, let's say, the very comfortable corporate job with a nice corner office. It comes down to identity. And so it's like my whole identity is I'm a partner in this accounting firm or law firm or I'm a tenure professor. And if I don't have that, I'm nothing. My only self-worth is in my job 
and my office and my bank account and my nice house and my nice cars. And I'm not against that. I mean, I'm blessed to have, despite everything I've gone through a very nice lifestyle and, you know, I'm not hurting financially and I'm blessed by that. So I'm not against that, but it comes down to your identity is not in your job or in your bank account. If it is, you are in real trouble because if you get, if there's a downturn in the economy, that means there'll be a downturn in your identity, which is not good. But in terms of faith, which is linked to identity, I'm very clear about my you know, Christian faith. I'm an elder in a non-denominational church. But as I kind of write in the book, and I actually have a chapter on faith, I'm a coach at heart, so I believe everybody has the God-given right to find their own path. It could be a major religion, you know, such as Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. It could be a philosophy, a set of values and beliefs. I think most people today, certainly most young people, they're not religious, but they are spiritual in the broad sense of that word. Young people in this generation, as much as any in recent memory, just design meaning and purpose. You, know, you want to hire somebody and you say, yeah, our job, we're all about making money and for the shareholders, but there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no contribution to society. It's all about money. Try finding a good employee in today's job market. It's hard enough as it is, as right. your listeners know, but you will find it extremely difficult. So, you know, you shouldn't be all about what do I need to do to hire the, you know, the next uh, best young person, but you, know, you better value meaning and purpose if you mm -hmm. want to hire anybody decent. That tells you something. So people are not necessarily into organized religion today. All the surveys from Barna and others will tell you that, will tell us that, but they are into meaning and purpose. So by faith, I'm really talking about it more broadly. I'm clear where I stand in my Christian faith, but everybody needs to find their path. And I think meaning and purpose and identity is key. So if you're 45 and hate your job, you get in touch with what you believe. It's not about what I or you believe, but you know, what does you as an individual believe? And are you living in light of that? Very often people are not. They don't intend to live out of tune with their beliefs because that would be strange and you would need significant counseling if you do that your whole life you know i believe something but I be i'm living 180 degrees uh, uh, in the opposite direction of everything i believe in you will not be happy if you do that yeah so it's and you know and decouple your identity from what you do easy to say but most people don't we have intense intrinsic value as human beings you know the the painter has as much value uh, and worth as somebody in business, as a teacher, as a construction worker, they all have equal value. One is not more valuable than the other, not from any major religion's perspective, certainly not from a Christian religion's perspective. So identity and faith, they're, they're all coupled, but by faith, I'm looking at a broader, broader framework. Got it. Got it. And I would agree that a lot of younger folks today have abandoned organized religion in large part especially in the metropolitan areas of the country. Mm -hmm. But I wonder where they are spiritual. They do have uh, very significant feelings around purpose and meaning. Um, but I wonder where they're going to find a community to share that in the future. I mean, I grew up in a church. You grew up in a church of that of mm -hmm. our generation, our kids' generation, maybe not so much so. Um, it's, it's an interesting quandary that I know the churches are suffering and the synagogues and organized religions are, but it's an interesting kind of curiosity of mine that yeah. what do young people, where are they going to find their community? That's a great question. I mean, there's not an easy answer. I mean, you know, if you, if you understand what your beliefs are, maybe you can find other people uh, like you for some, it may be, you know, it could be ecological, you know, I believe, you know, preserving the environment. Maybe you find folks, that you know really are into that particular um, cause or issue, but yeah, it's 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 not easy. I mean, if if you're put your church out, I mean, maybe you know you all of us are trying to do it to do to a degree. Try to make sure that you know what what you're about is meeting the needs of young people. That it's addressing their concerns. It won't solve everything because it still comes under the mantra of an organized denomination or religion, which some people say, look, there's so much hypocrisy and you know, why I do it, which I get. There's, there's, we could have a whole discussion about that. P young people have a lot of reason to be skeptical and distrustful, and, you know, which I find very sad, mm -hmm. irrespective of the religion or denomination. But 
It's a good question. It's it's not easy to find people who who will like you if it's not part of some organized group. I don't know how you do that. It's a good right. question. So we'll shift gears and maybe make take it a little easier. We'll go back to the book. <laughs> um, you have a lot of um, conversation around authenticity and vulnerability and leadership. <clears throat> and I want to ask you, why do you believe this is so important in not only leading a company, but leading any organization? Yeah, it's funny. It does come back to identity is if your whole sense of persona is I'm a partner in this law firm, for instance, and if I'm not a partner, I'm worth nothing, then it will be incredibly hard for you to be authentic and vulnerable. If they see the real me, they may not follow me. But the irony is young people today, more than ever, they want authenticity. They want vulnerability. You know, they don't want kind of, uh, you know, plastic people with the, with the smile, who've read all the books, you know, you could ask the right questions, but if young people will tell it a mile away, if you're just doing it because somebody told you to do it in some book or some coach, you know, hey, how's the family? How's it going? What are your hopes and dreams? I mean, if that's just some canned question, you know, it will just drive them nuts. They'll just probably leave the next day. So um, yeah, I think it's, you know, if you're comfortable in your own skin, look, you know, I've made, you know, can you, a, a good leader knows they've made mistakes. They're vulnerable for a purpose. You don't have to share every dumb thing you've ever did done. But if it's like, yep, I remember when I was just starting off in uh, company X and, you know, I was a young lawyer and boy, I sort of uh, blew that first case I was on and I was lucky not to be fired. Should have been fired. I really just messed up. I had a few late nights partying and I don't know, I was just a goofball and I was an idiot. Well, if you're sharing that story for a purpose and I learned some lessons, maybe young person say, gosh, you're like me, you make mistakes. Okay, good. That's vulnerability for a purpose. So I think you know, if you want to lead people, especially today, you have to be authentic. You have to be vulnerable um, more than any other time. So it makes frankly good business sense to be authentic and vulnerable, but also it's, it's freeing. It's like if, if your team will follow you when they know that you're not perfect and, you're, and you will admit your mistakes, it's like, I can be me. In fact, I'm leading even better. My numbers are even better. My clients like the fact that I'm actually authentic and vulnerable. You know, uh, it just, um, it's sort of amazing how, uh, you know, your leadership can go to another level if you're willing to, to risk being authentic and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you just got, I mean, it does work, uh, but you've just, and it, again, it's coupled with identity. If your identity is all wrapped up in what you do, then it would be almost impossible for you to be authentic and vulnerable. So you yeah. got to, Got to deal with the internal to do that. Interesting. So the book is called uh, Crucible Moment. You're talking a lot about hardships, challenges, tough times. Um, what if what if a leader never had a crucible moment? What if life has been fantastic all the way around and they've never, it's very hard to believe that nobody has been challenged because everybody has their challenges. But how do you address that if people really have never had a crucible moment in their life? Yeah, it's a great question. It's funny, at Crucible Leadership, we did a study of um, uh, maybe 400 plus uh, business leaders and 50% said that they'd gone through, you know, a crucible moment that was so painful that it was life transforming. So it won't be everybody, but it will be most people. And even if it's not a massive crucible moment, there are things in life, maybe we were kind of overweight as a teenager or you know, got cut from the, the uh, you know, dance recital uh, group or, you know, basketball team. It may not be epic crucibles, or maybe you got passed over for that promotion. Everybody's gone through setbacks, um, not always massive crucibles, but I think, you know, really what we're about at Crucible Leadership is helping people live lives of significance, which again, life on purpose dedicated to serving others. So if you want happiness and fulfillment and joy, which most humans that I know do, if you want that, it has to be outward focused. So whether or not you've been through a crucible, the question would be, given who I am and my talents and my beliefs, how do I spend my one and only life? Everybody has 70, 80, 90 years, whatever it is. And that will, all, that, you know, the law would be an expiration day for all of us. How do I live a life that will leave a legacy that I'm proud of? And this is not a, an original thought. I'm sure you've heard it many times before. But at my funeral, what do I want my eulogy to say? 
Yep, Fred and Mary, they were the they were the top investment bank on Wall Street. They were amazing. They did the deals they did were incredible. Okay, great. I don't think that's what you want. I mean, that's nice. But what did my kids think of me? What did my wife or husband think of me? You know, what about my friends? Did I leave a legacy that people can be proud of in terms of how I affected other humans, in terms of what I did as a person? So every person on the planet wants to leave a legacy they can be proud of. So as we say often, you know, live your legacy today. What's one thing I can do today to begin building a legacy that my kids and my spouse and friends and coworkers can be proud of? So it doesn't have to come out of a crucible experience. It often does, but either way, rather than just drifting through life and oh, I'm going to get that next promotion because, well, isn't that what you're meant to do? You know, it's like, well, what, what do I want my life to be like? Don't think on your deathbed, oops, you know, is this how I live my life? It's too, well, late, it's too then. late then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, the same it's too thing. late. It's, <laughs> it's like, you know, I know you're in risk management. When do you want to think of risk management? when you're about to go under and you are underinsured and everything's about to blow up, oops, yeah. you know, Gordon, I should have listened to you. <laughs> no, like, you're right. You should have listened to me, but it's too late. Too you late now. Say, you, you, you idiot, because you never call your client an idiot, but <laughs> you know, you want to you have that risk management conversation five, 5, 10, 15 years before the cataclysm hits, right? Right. Right. Interesting perspective, because I think sometimes we always think about if we're, you know, using terminology like crucible moment that we have to have, you know, walk through the, the fire, the wall of flames and all of that. But if you break it down, even as something as simple as, um, you know, being passed over for a promotion or even as a kid, you didn't get invited to whatever event or, you know, we carry those things. A lot of people carry those weights for a long period of time. And it takes, you know, takes a while. It, it prevents people from taking that next step very often because they're afraid. Again, that weird, that word fear that we talked about earlier, I have faced that in my own life where, you know, I wasn't athletic as a kid. So I, Oh, I can't do that. And now I've challenged myself to, you know, do, pretty extraordinary athletic things that people are like, you're out of your mind at your age. <laughs> even when I have to go visit the um, orthopedist, he's like, what are you doing at your age? So <laughs> I can appreciate that. Well, um, you, you can, you can tell him, or tell her I'm living my life. Exactly. I'm living, I'm living my life to the fullest. That's what <laughs> I'm doing. <laughs> What's the expression? When I get to the grave, I want to be beat up, broken up. You know, I want to be totally busted up by the time I get there. I don't want to be well preserved. <laughs> exactly. Well said. Uh, so I, I want to touch on going kind of back a bit. Um, uh, in the book, you have a lot of stories about historical leaders and how they overcame the hardship and challenges, which we just touched on. Um, do you have a favorite story, a favorite historical person or figure that, um, you know, you, you really enjoy talking about or thinking about? I do, and it's actually one that you know your listeners wouldn't have heard of. It's actually my great great grandfather, uh, John Fairfax. Um, he uh, had a small paper in a small town in England in the 1830s, and he published a story about an unscrupulous lawyer, basically saying that lawyer was corrupt. So this lawyer sued John Fairfax, my great great grandfather, and the judge found in John Fairfax's favor, saying your story was accurate, but back then. The law was different. You had to pay your own court costs, even if you won, you know? So, um, and so he was bankrupted. Oh. Definitely a righteous person, you know, persecuted. Now he could have said, look, I've had this. You're an idiot to start your own business. Unscrupulous people will bankrupt, you know, the small business guy. But at that point, he left England. Maybe he thought, you know, forget this. I need to move to a new country, move to Australia. And with a business partner, founded the Sydney Morning Herald that grew into John Fairfax Limited, a massive media company. So he didn't let that, he didn't let that um, crucible destroy him. Uh, one story that listeners, uh, well, they will have heard of the name, maybe not the story, similar actually in some sense, uh, Walt Disney. Uh, he uh, was in Los Angeles and he took the train in the 20s to New York because he didn't not too many people flew cross country in the 1920s, a little bit scary with biplanes and all. Uh, so he had a deal with a New York uh, City uh, distributor for his cartoons. Now, Walt was a, he was an anime, not a business guy. Well, this unscrupulous distributor 
wrote some fine print in the contract that said that he owned all of the intellectual property of Walt Disney at the time. And at the time, the big deal was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Back in like 20s, early 30s, whatever it was, that was kind of big. And so, and not only that, he also uh, pinched all of Walt's key animators, threw him a bunch of money. So he's betrayed by his distributor, betrayed by his key team. So here he is on the train back from New York to LA with his wife, Lily. And rather than feeling despondent, he started doodling on a napkin, three circles that looked like a mouse. And he said to his wife, how about Mortimer Mouse? And his wife said, I'm not saying that. How about Mickey? So, you know, sometimes listening to your wife is good. But similar stories in that he could have said, look, you know, I'm not going to start a business again. You know, these unscrupulous distributors, they'll just rip you off. They'll destroy you. I'm just, I'm going to work for somebody else. I'm never going to found a business ever again, because why do that? But both people, John Fairfax and Walt Disney, they did not give up, and they, you know. Nobody's ever heard of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Everybody's heard of Mickey Mouse. So, you know, it's a story of just moving on. Maybe there's probably some forgiveness, but certainly not given up just because of a massive setback, both of which mm -hmm. they had. Mm -hmm. How long was this book brewing in your mind for you? You know, I think, as I mentioned, in 2008, when I gave that talk in church, before then, if people might have asked, oh, you know, do you think you'll write a book? I said, ah, oh, you know why to write a book about something that's so painful and I never want to write a, t a tell all, you know, it was woe is me. It was, you know, everybody else's fault. You know, never want to write that kind of book, which is be boring. But yeah, I mean, from 2008, it took a few years to write, but then to find a publisher in Australia, they wanted more of a tell all or, you know, that kind of book. And then I had to build up a, you know, a brand and, following email list and blog and my own podcast, Beyond the Crucible. So it took a while. So that book was published like October, 2021. I started writing it in 2008. Wow. So, yeah, it took, I don't know, the first draft maybe took four or five years to write. There were more drafts after, but it was a long journey, but it was absolutely worth, worth it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, what drove me forward is the idea that if this can help people, it is worth pursuing the journey. Uh, you know, because people often don't write about failure, especially business failure. It's a very rare, it's a very rare, rare thing. One kind of quick story, I was um, on a Harvard Business School alumni podcast a year or two ago, and the guy that was organizing it chatted to one of my team and said, you know, almost whispering, you know, is, is Warwick willing to talk about failure? Because basically, Harvard MBAs don't talk about failure. You know, business people, it's like, well, that is the point. That's kind of the brand. That's what I do. I've come to peace with it. I do it for a reason. But people in business do not like talking about failure. Because well, why is that? Well, because my identity is wrapped up in what I do. I was just going to say, you, <laughs> you're throwing your identity you, under the bus. <laughs> if I tell you that I failed on my business, I'm saying I'm a failure as a human being. It's what I'm telling you. Yeah. That's how they perceive it, which is so sad. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, I want to kind of wrap up with life of significance. You've kind of talked about that a couple of times. Um, how, how, if you've never self-examined this, and, and that's what it really is, is self-examination. Sure. Um, how does somebody take that first step? How do they really get to the root of this? I think, first of all, it's putting a stake in the ground and saying, I do want a life of significance a life on purpose dedicated to serving others. So make that decision. So the question is, well, what's my, what do I want my legacy to be? What's my purpose? How do I serve others? <clears throat> it always begins in how are you wired? And if you're some creative person that likes to paint, it's probably going to be creative. Maybe you're a numbers guy or a numbers woman. It's like, I just love the magic of numbers. Or maybe it's in finance or accounting uh, or math. So understand how you're wired you know, what is it I really believe, you know, um, it could be organized religion, denomination, uh, faith, values, you know, what are the things that I hold most dear? And then for those who have been in a crucible, often, you know, that question about how can I help people not go through what I went through? Because people are going to be able to identify with me because I'll say he or she knows what they're talking about. They've walked in my shoes. 
<clears throat> which is absolutely critical. But even if you haven't been through a crucible, it's like, okay, based on my design and my fundamental beliefs and values, what do I feel that the world needs? What do I feel like that just really angers me so much that people get hurt by X? And I wished I could help even 1% of people not be hurt by X. We are often motivated by both helping people avoid pain, or wouldn't it be wonderful if they had this? So, I mean, once you do all of that, and there's a lot of steps in there, but in terms of making a step towards the vision, you may not be sure, talk to people, but try something. Even if it's having a meeting with somebody, maybe maybe it's not taking a full-time job in it, maybe it's volunteering on the side. So maybe you know, you're concerned with you know, the homeless in big cities or people who've had substance abuse issues or whatever it is, <clears throat> try something on the side. And if it's like, gosh, I find more meaning in the half hour I, or the hour I volunteered at this nonprofit than I do during the day job. Well, there's, there's something there. Doesn't mean you'll go full on in the nonprofit. Maybe you can, you know, uh, collaborate in some ways, you know, uh, business, nonprofit partnership, but just, you know, try, try a step in an area that you really have passion around. And the vision is not going to come in a 10 year plan because uh, life isn't that simple, unfortunately. I mean, talk about faith in terms of there may be a plan, but we're just typically told the next step, the next turn, and you know, in the journey. You know, we're never given the whole hundred mile GPS, but told turn left if you believe in any kind of spirituality. So try that next step that you think, boy, I I, I would so love to try X. Well, we'll do that. You know, low cost way initially, but then over time you'll decide if you want to go more and more full in to whatever that is. Yeah. You're not saying you have to stop everything that you're doing now and go hundred percent no. in just, just try no. something else, you know? And I think that's exactly. good advice. Um, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, well, let's first off talk about that. You do have a book <laughs> called crucible leadership. It's available everywhere. Correct. Exactly. Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trials to Lead a Life of Significance. And it's available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Uh, you can also get the ebook, uh, Kindle and other platforms. And believe it or not, uh, there's actually an audio book, which I spent the best part of a week in a sound booth uh, narrating. So if you want to listen to me for five or six hours, the audio book <laughs> is there too. So there's, there's multiple ways you can consume the book. <laughs> I just, I, I, I've just gotten into listening to books because... Um, if I sit down at night to read, I just, my eyes close. So listening to a book, whether it's when I'm out running or in the gym or whatever, or working around the house, I find very enjoyable. And the last one I listened to, I can't remember the title of it, the author, oh, it was um, Scott Galloway, who was a professor at um, NYU. And he's talking about post COVID and the economy mm -hmm. and all kinds of business things. He said, the most painful thing I've ever done in my life is had to narrate this book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it can be a challenge, but yeah, I had a great team, and yeah, that was it's kind of fun actually in some ways. <laughs> cool. So the book is available. Um, uh, your website is yeah, it's crucibleleadership.com. I'm active on social media on LinkedIn uh, under my name Warwick Fairfax, and uh, Facebook Crucible Leadership. Um, we also have our own podcast Beyond the Crucible where we interview all sorts of people from all backgrounds, uh, with all kinds of crucibles. How do they bounce back from their worst day to lead a fulfilling life, life is significant. So uh, some different touch points. Cool. So what I'm going to do is I'll take all of those uh, social uh, uh, touch points and the podcast, and I'll put the links to them in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description box. Um, if it's a podcast, you'll be seeing it in the show notes. Um, so Warwick, great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Any final thoughts that you want to put out there? Well, thanks so much, Gordon, for having me. And I'd say for those who um, maybe today is their worst day, it's the bottom of their crucible, or they hate their job, but they can't, they feel like they can't leave. And it's just, you know, it's like going to this gray factory and they're just depressed every time they get on the subway or go into the front door. Or maybe these days it's, it's turn on the Zoom to talk to that hated boss and hated team again, whatever it is, uh, you know, there is hope. Uh, there is a path back from your worst day. There is a path to leading a fulfilling, joy-filled life, a life of significance. So there is hope. It just requires one step. You know, what's one positive thing that I can move forward to building a life of significance, a legacy I can be proud of. So 
Today may be very grim, but what's one positive thing that I can do today to move forward? That's a, uh, a very positive and worthwhile message, and I'm glad that we ended on that note. And I'll also add that if you have an interesting story like Warwick's, maybe not as, as interesting, uh, and you'd like to be on this podcast, please reach out to me. My info will also appear in the show notes. And until next time, thanks for listening and watching, and we'll see you around the next time. Warwick, thank you again. Oh, thank you. That's it for this week's episode of the New York Business Leaders Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode. In the meantime, find more interviews and resources at nybusinessleaders.com.